Sage Wanderer here, and welcome to Episode 9 of Unmasking the Dark Side. Now, in Episodes 7 and 8, um, I think that I have made myself clear that the mythology of those two episodes were really about the history according to the secret societies, that regardless of the nature of the secret society, when you get to the very top, the thing that they teach you, the thing that they reveal to you, is that you are descended from dragons from another planet. Or, if you're not descended from them, you should probably worship those of us who are descended from dragons. Do, do, do. As weird as that seems. And this ties directly to the conspiracy theories of shape-shifting shape reptilians amongst us, especially those in high positions of royalty. And I won't get into RH negative blood, uh, other than to say I am RH negative, so I don't know <laughs> what that means for me. But what I do want to talk about is where I left us in the previous episode, historically, timeline-wise, in this prehistory, this mysterious, misty, foggy time of post-creation, but prior to the Flood. There is very little information about what was going on during that time in the Bible. And Noah's Flood really isn't about the circumstances for, uh, for which the Flood happened. It doesn't go into depth. For more information on that, you might want to look at a book called the Book of Giants. Uh, the sec is it the second book of Enoch? Um, in that book, it talks specifically about these giants, these Nephilim, uh, the sons of God that looked down upon the daughters of men and found them beautiful. And the offspring thereof were giants or men of renown. Were there giants in the land then? I think it's clear. <laughs> then and afterwards. But I believe that much of the mythology from the gods of, Olymp of Olympus, the gods of the Greeks and the Romans, the gods of the Vikings, Thor and Odin, uh, Quasicuatl, the Mesoamerican dragon god, all of these entities are not just made up. I think they're true. I think they're stories from before the flood. And I think all of them combined tell the, the narrative of what was making God so angry that he felt like he needed to destroy the earth with a flood. Because there were dragons and giants and mermaids and there were chimeras because they were playing God, these sons of God, these offspring of fallen angels. They were experimenting with genetics and DNA and they were creating these chimeras, these hybrids, uh, Pan, who's half goat, half human, who played his flute and seduced children. Uh -huh. The Minotaur, you know, the uh, the crazed half bull, half human. Birdmen from Egyptian mythology. All of these myths, myths are based on pre-flood civilizations. They were based around the capital of the pre-Diluvian world, I believe it was. Atlantis. Don't, don't, don't. That's right, Atlantis. Atlantis, though, was just the above ground portion of this advanced civilization that was basically founded here by fallen angels. Yes, this planet was founded in so many ways by these demonic angels who came down and created this huge civilization on Earth. And um, the above ground portion was called Atlantis. And I think from my research, if a place did exist, it could exist as a continent that's even bigger than an island. That there is a ridge in the mid-Atlantic where the water is very shallow compared to the rest of the ocean floor. And in a time when there was more ice, for instance, and the water levels were lower than uh, much of the area that is now underwater in that ridge, that plateau in the Atlantic, would be above ground and would represent a sizable uh, and interesting shaped uh, uh, continent. 
and it would make travel between the the uh, hemispheres and between the uh, the continents much easier with that because you could almost cross it in a rowboat because it took up so much space as to just have large channels seas like uh, oh I don't know like um, well, the English Channel is, brings springs to mind, where one could cross that in a small boat, making it much easier to get from the old world to what we would go on to call the new world, which maybe isn't so new after all. Um, so you've got the above ground Atlantis capital, but then you've got under the earth living going on as well uh, in Lemuria and Argatha and Shambhala, which you talked about in previous videos, the hollow earth inhabitants. And then also there's the legends of the undersea cities as well, the bubbles, the glo globes underwater civilizations ruled by Poseidon. So all of the earth was inhabited by these evil creatures. The Bible does let us know that and that they needed to be destroyed. And God tells Noah that he will destroy everything that breathes. Um, and so you have the story of the eight survivors of the flood in Noah's story. But I would like to say that, you know, Noah's story isn't about the flood. If it were, there would be a lot more details. His story isn't about the punishment that God doled out, or there would be more information about the wicked sin they were all guilty of. No, Noah's story is about how he and his family survived the flood with God's direct intervention and how he was given superior structural engineering knowledge to build a craft that would overcome what I believe would turn out to be a tsunami more than the kind of flood that maybe we envision. So I will say this, that Noah's story, when you look at all of the mythology, is not unique. And he was not the only person, or not the only people that survived, that there were pockets of survivors. Um, and they may have survived with God's help, and they may have survived despite all of the mayhem. Especially those living under the earth, that those caverns would be easy to survive. Imagine a sink drain, a trap, and then you, you do that trap to trap... Uh, leave water hanging basically to create so you can have an area that is flooded and another area behind it that is higher up for instance in the top of a mountain uh, there's so many different ways that you can create pockets of breathable air underground in the event of a total covering of the earth if that's in fact what completely happened uh, but as we move on it may not be the whole story um Really, you have to go to books like the Book of Enoch, and you have to go to other mythologies to kind of fill in the blanks, because the Bible is just a great big open space there as far as what really happened. Um, what I will tell you is when you start to look at these other mythologies, then you hear about ant people who came from under the ground and warned Native Americans, Native Anastasi, uh, Native Americans, Anastasi? I think so. Uh, the ones in southern Colorado who lived in the caves that these ant people came and saved them from the surface, warning them of a great deluge and cataclysm that would include projectiles from the sky as well as floods and earthquakes and volcanoes and all manner of mayhem, and that they should go with them underground, and they did for 200 years until the earth resumed some normalcy, and they went back to the surface to start their civilization. You also hear of star men who came from the sky. You hear of fish people in Japan who came from the ocean. And then you also hear of flying dragon people in Mesoamerica. All of these individuals could be various survivors of the flood and various people that were around at the time. And, you know, all civilizations have a story of how these people, the star people, the fish people, the ant people, the dragon people, how they brought civilization to humankind, how they brought commerce and trade, how they brought property rights animal husbandry, crop cultivation, laws, roads, justice, culture and music and writing all come from these survivors of the great flood who emerged either from underground, from the ocean, from a spacecraft, or just flew in under the power of their own wings. Whew. And then you've got the Indian legends. 
and how that might relate to the stories of Atlantis. And the ancient Indian scripture, the Mahabharata, the Mahabharata, let's say that three times fast, Mahabharata, Mahabharata, Mahabharata. <laughs> This mythology suggests that the flood might have been the result of a massive nuclear explosion that destroyed Atlantis. It says, you know, God destroyed the earth with a flood, but he didn't, didn't really explain to you how he did it. Maybe it was nuclear. So this mythology talks about uh, this massive nuclear explosion and how it destroyed this entire race of people. And... Uh, you know, potentially they're talking about Atlantis here, and some of the word uh, studies of the names of the tribes that were killed off, when you look at them, they seem to have the AT, the earmark of Atlantis in their, in their names. So, the explosion destroyed Atlantis and potentially covered the Earth with a giant tsunami, and that's what the flood was, uh, was a, an enormous tsunami that swept around the globe from this one impact of this immense weapon and that a nuclear winter was brought on that created an ice age. And so in the uh, Mahabharata, they talk about Vermana, which seems to be flying craft like airplanes uh, or even UFOs, um, spacecraft potentially. And this is a quote from the Mahabharata scripture. And it says that one of their gods was flying a swift and powerful Vermana and he hurled a single projectile charged with the power of the universe, an incandescent column of smoke and flame as bright as 10,000 suns rose with all its splendor. It was an unknown weapon, an iron thunderbolt, a gigantic messenger of death." Unquote. Some of the effects of the people around the periphery of this weapon that weren't burned alive in a flash of light um, were it included hair loss, fingernail loss, uh, lots of symptoms that appear like nuclear uh, radiation poisoning. The food became poisoned and anyone that eat it, ate it got sick and the birds were turned white, potentially with fallout or ash. And the net result of this war might explain some of the mysteries of our earth like the great deserts of the world, especially the Sahara Desert. That this desert, that scientists don't really know why it's a desert when once it seemed to be more like an ocean uh, or a lush uh, rainforest. And you've got, uh, that, that might have been caused by a pole shift that created a sudden climate change. That might explain the mystery of these mammoths, mammoths these woolly mammoths that are found flash frozen under feet, thick ice, and uh, found inside of their stomachs, perfectly preserved after all of these hundreds of years, thousands of years potentially, inside the stomachs of these woolly mammoth are tropical vegetation still undigested, that that's how quickly they were frozen. And really only a pole shift, a sudden move of the earth. And you know, this might explain why the earth is tilted on its axis instead of straight up and down. Um, this might explain why parts of the earth that are now desert were, were once ocean and have fish and shell uh, fossils in them. It might explain uh, the creation of the Rocky Mountains that could have been caused by the cracking of the earth's mantle from the impact of this explosion. Um, that it could cause continents to shift Maybe part of this is what happened with Pangaea and the breaking apart of some of the land masses into smaller continents and islands. This might be when the when the ridge is submerged is submerged um, by melting ice from the existing ice caps, and then when the Earth shifted, the new ice caps covered Antarctica, which at one time was probably a civilization and a city. Uh, people have found say they found pyramids and in Antarctica. And um, but through all of this, the tsunami, the flood, the nuclear winter, the ice age, the cracking of the Earth's mantle, the, the pole shift, the flipping of the Earth on its axis, somehow the giants survived. We'll get to more of that later. 
But it does appear that there were more survivors than just Noah and his family. That amongst them were these reptilians, these giants, these Nephilim that seemed to still be around at the time of uh, David. And definitely were around when... Um, they were conquering the Holy Land. They occupied the Holy Land. Some of them were said to be 16 feet tall. Double road teeth. Six fingers. Not human, right? So these giants uh, somehow survived. And it seems to me that humans survived as well. And that these survivors either founded places like Egypt and built the pyramids that you find in Mesoamerica, or they were already there and the survivors, when the water receded, tried to find their way back to where their civilizations were and rebuilt around the pyramids. But you've also got all these megalithic structures and, you know, from Stonehenge to the, the cities, the high mountain cities in Peru, you've got, uh, you've got huge ruins in Turkey. Um, and some of these really, they start to elude to stone melting, that they look like that the, that the rock has been reduced to soft butter and could be reformed and shaped. And that some of their, some of their um, connections in their masonry is so tight that there's no way you could slip even a, a hair between them. And that there are these... Um, uh, old uh, stories, these mythologies, these legends of, by the local Peruvians especially that talk about uh, giants coming there who had handheld devices that would levitate huge stones and that they had a wand that would shoot a ray of light that would melt the stone and cause it all to fit together and that there are some stones in some of these uh, monolithic structures that look like they were scooped out with an ice cream scoop or looked like someone took their finger and just went like this through solid granite. So there was some kind of technology at work there. And um, then there's these things called dolmen. I don't know if you've ever heard of these. I was surprised to find out that there are m millions of these things on every continent all around the globe. And they're simple stone structures which seem impossible for anyone to make. For one thing, the, they kind of look they look suspiciously a lot like Fred Flintstone's house. So I don't know, they must have based Fred Flintstone's house on these dolmens because they essentially are two or three vertical uh, uh, stones with a giant horizontal capstone placed on top at an angle for water runoff. And many of them have a hole, like a hobbit hole, bored in the fourth front. And they're, I mean, they just look like Fred Flintstone's house. You know where he throws the dog out the round window? at the end of, or that's the cat or something, at the end of the night. <laughs> I love the Flintstones. Were they trying to tell us something? Uh, do, do, do. <laughs> but these dolmen are, are all around the globe, and some of those capstones weigh up to 1.2 million pounds. 1.2 million pounds, 600 tons of solid stone. How did that get moved? Could it be the magic wand the Peruvians talked about? The device that did the levitation? But these, according to some legends, the dolmens were built by giants post-flood who survived the flood for the purpose of emergency housing for human beings. Uh, so that, that some of these giants, these men of renown, survived the flood, built these dolmens for humans to live in post-apocalypse. So, did these structures survive the flood? Or were they built before the flood? Did survivors of the flood build them? And, um, you know, a lot of our culture comes from these people that survived according to all of these various legends. Um, are, these res are these survivors responsible for the giants in the Old Testament? Is that, is that who those were? Goliath? Uh, those men were those giant survivors. Was there another Nephilim crossbreeding to create these giants? I don't think so. I think they survived the flood somehow. And, um, you know, are they survivors from that pre-Diluvian, pre pre-flood era of gods and monsters? Did some of these evil creatures survive into current times? Are there dragon people today? You know, are these... 
people, the reptilian shapeshifters whose invisible hand enslaves humanity even to this day? Wow. When you go to tracing the dark side, you never know where you're going to end up. And uh, it goes so far back. I will say this. There is an evil loose in the world. And I've never been more frightened for humanity than I am right now. And I have to say, like the Bible says, that things today are probably looking a lot like they were in the days of Noah. So join us next time on episode 10 of Unmasking the Dark Side with Sage Wonder. Thanks.